All right, welcome everybody. I'm Lindsay Carlson. I'm the manager at the Russian Conservation Center, uh, which is where I am today, um, with Lauren in her watershed department just around the corner. And um, welcome to Plastic Free July Lunch and Learn. And we're really excited you're all here. This is a, a, a great topic, um, especially as things continue to change in our world. And um, just a couple of um, things about, I wanted to mention, so I'm just gonna admit somebody here. Um, just for the format, uh, so we're gonna go through the, the presentation. We're gonna have a really nice chunk of time at the end for some Q&A. And if there's anything that comes to mind while the, while Lauren is presenting, please use the raise your hand function and, and remain on mute and we will turn our attention to you or just use the chat feature and type anything you want in there and Lauren and I, you know, we will uh, manage getting to everybody to have a nice lively discussion and share some ideas at the end. So I turn it over to you, Lauren. All right, great. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and thank you all for joining us today uh, to really delve into what it means to be plastic free in an age of COVID. Um, so before we really get too far into it, I want to acknowledge that we started doing Plastic Free July at Willistown Conservation Trust in 2019 um, because we encountered this organization called Plastic Free July. Um, they're based out of Australia and they have an amazing amount of resources that you can explore um, including a pledge that you can take to either to go plastic free for a day, a uh, week, or the whole month. Um, but there's lots of resources to see what kind of options you have to go plastic free. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, we're presenting uh, this topic as Willistown Conservation Trust, and we're a small land trust located in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and we've been working on protecting open space since the 1970s and have succeeded in protecting over 7,500 um, acres. We use all of the different landscapes in our area to really um, examine the connections between land, birds, um, our farm, habitat, and water um, to really see how we can be better stewards for our planet. Um, and it's really important to us to connect people to the land and develop a deeper commitment to save um, open space as development continues to increase, especially in southeastern Pennsylvania. So I care a lot about Plastic Free July because when I go to the store and see things like this, it makes me feel crazy. Um, and unfortunately, shelves like this are becoming more and more common as the global health pandemic continues. Um, because there's this perception that plastic protects vegetables and fruits from being contaminated with um, viruses and germs. But, you know, the reality is that these vegetables are prepackaged in their own biodegradable film. So why are we wrapping um, oranges that are pre-wrapped um, with a skin with a product that takes tens of thousands of years to break down in our environment? The reality is, is that we love plastic. It is so good at what it does. Um, and these statistics are from 2017, so they're a little out of date, but they all remain true with the reality being that they've probably increased by about 10%. Um, we produce over 300 million tons of plastic per year. And of that 300 million, about half is single use plastic. And the truth around single use oh my goodness the truth around single use plastic is that the lifespan and the usefulness it, it's only about 10 to 12 minutes if you think about say your bananas in a bag you purchase your bananas from the store you check it out at the cart you bring it home you unpack your goods and you throw away that plastic so that time period of really transport is the only time that a single that single use plastic bag is being utilized so unfortunately, when it's discarded, it takes a millennia to break down and it's actively um, clogging up our ocean environments particularly. So we discuss plastic really as a, an ocean problem, a downstream problem. But let's take a second to reflect that we all live in watersheds. And this is important um, to me and my department at Willistown 
I work in the Watershed Protection Program, and we look at the headwater streams of Ridley, Crum, and Darby Creeks, um, which are all tributaries to the Delaware River Basin. And the Delaware feeds into the Delaware Bay, which is in the Atlantic Ocean. So any sort of waste or wasteful activity that we participate in, in these headwater areas, it will end up in the ocean given enough time. Um, so, you know, I'm here and Lindsay and I are sitting in Ridley Creek watershed. And I know with this digital platform, you guys could be all over the world. Um, so if you're in the United States, you can take a second to orient yourself to where you are in the watershed by looking at this countrywide watershed map. And I love this map because it does highlight that no matter where you are, you could be a thousand miles from the ocean, you are still participating in activities that will impact the ocean given enough time. Um, so if you're in, you know, the middle of the country, you're probably in the Mississippi basin and it might take a hundred years, but your candy wrapper that fell out of your pocket while you were hiking will eventually wind up in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and this is important because we're so used to um, identifying where we are based on our municipality or our county, especially now. Um, so I challenge you when this talk is over to figure out what watershed you're in and start thinking about the world from a watershed perspective. Um, during this talk, I'm going to mention plastics and microplastics almost interchangeably, but there is a very big difference between those two words. Um, plastic is a macro plastic, which is a, a large thing. Think about um, a grocery bag is a macro plastic. Microplastics is any piece of plastic that is smaller than five millimeters. So about the size of a hole punched circle. And that microplastic is a really important distinguishing, um, the size is an important distinguishing feature because as plastics break down either through chemical or physical weathering, it changes size, but it does not change its behavior. So plastics are all polymers. A polymer is just a repeating um, compound that just repeats over and over and over these similar units. And so it doesn't matter if it's a sheet the size of this building or a tiny little hole punch piece of plastic. It's the same thing. Um, and it's important when we think about microplastics that the size is often tricky for organisms to identify. For example, the small pieces of plastic that are featured on the screen are called nurdles. And a nurdle is something that is just melted down to, into a form to make something else. But when nurdles spill into the ocean, it's a huge problem because they look like fish eggs and they look like a tasty treat, but unfortunately they have no nutritional value and are really hard to pass through a digestive system of a fish or a bird. And so they can cause a lot of long-term damage. So if you shrink down the plastic down to the molecular level and you flake a piece off that's 10 nanometers, which is microscopic or smaller, that's called picoplastic. And we're not gonna talk about picoplastics today because it's its own um, kind of can of worms. So we're just gonna focus on these small pieces of pl plastic that are less than five millimeters. If any of this is unclear or you're confused or you have a comment or a question, please fill it in, um, put it in the chat feature and I'll do my best to address it. All right, let's dive in. There's a lot of different types of plastic and the malleability of plastic is what makes it such a cool and useful and important feature in our modern lives. But because there's different types, we can identify what things used to be in the past before it washed into our ocean and became microplastic. The most common types of plastics in our ocean um, are polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene. So polyethylene uh, is things like plastic bags and old storage containers. Um, and it makes a lot of sense why this is so common. These are the things like saran wrap, uh, you use once, you throw away. If it escapes um, from your garbage can, it might blow away into a stream and get transported pretty rapidly. Polypropylene includes things like bottle caps, rope, and gear. And this is a really common source of, um, a common source of contamination for polypropylene it includes um, like long line trawlers or fishing boats that use netting to haul in their catch. Oftentimes, if those um, nets break, they're really, really hard to recover, and they can smother and drown um, aquatic animals. 
And then the third most common and my least favorite type of plastic is polystyrene, otherwise known as styrofoam. Um, cups, floats, coolers, containers, uh, styrofoam is one of the best insulators out there. But when it starts to break down, um, say you received a package that had styrofoam packing in there, it breaks into these tiny little balls that are almost impossible to clean up. They static connect to everything. And in the water, they look like something that could be really delicious. Um, and so it's a common um, product that is found in the guts of birds um, and aquatic animals. Similarly, polyethylene bags are often found in the guts of drowned sea turtles. Um, so there's a lot of different issues associated with the different plastics, but thankfully there's a lot of alternatives to using these plastics on a regular basis. So plastic in a marine environment, it is detrimental at every layer. Um, so this is a 2017 marine image of the year, um, and this is a seahorse that is using a plastic Q-tip um, to hold on to. So this pattern of behavior is really normal. The seahorse would normally be holding on to uh, seaweed or some sort of like wood detritus, all driftwood, it usually collects seahorses like this. And they're very well camouflaged to hide in that sort of environment. When it holds on to a Q-tip, it's like a little beacon that it does not belong um, with in this area it being the Q-tip, of course. Um, and it's a really distressing image, but I wanted to avoid having too many triggering pictures of dead animals. So um, we're gonna talk more about plastic consumption, but the non-consumable plastics are really, really important um, in the way that they interact with our marine and aquatic ecosystems. So, We've got our plastic, it's broken down in the ocean. We have our microplastics. So it, there's been a lot of research looking into the way microplastics impact our um, food pyramid in, in the waterways. Um, everything from Daphnia, which is a marine zooplankton, um, to seabirds have been known to consume plastics. Um, and plastic has this nasty little treat where it's got these kind of pockets and divots in it that are, are really, really good at attracting hazardous chemicals. And so they can kind of biomagnify or increase the amount of chemicals that are ingested. And so there's a lot of science that goes into that. And I'm going to try and keep this from becoming a chemistry lecture, but um, there's a lot um, that we're still learning about plastic in the environment. Um, because it's exposed to sunlight and salt and heat and cooling, a lot of transformations can happen um, between a normal inert plastic bag and the plastic microparticles that we're finding in our waterways. So if you're seeing these things, you're like, yeah, we already know birds eat plastic. It's not a big deal. I don't see how this impacts me. Like, Lauren, what's the point? You're also eating plastic. You just may not be aware of it. Um, so sorry if this is the first time you're hearing this. Um, but there have been widespread studies globally um, that have identified tap water, beer, sea salt, um, almost everything has some sort of microplastic components. And the current estimation is that we eat about a credit card's worth of plastic per week. And so I don't mean that you're, you know, grabbing a bottle cap and having a snack. But this is plastic that is invisible. It is so small, it is in our water, it's in our food. Um, and what does this mean? And, you know, are some weeks worth, worse than others? Sure. But if we break down a year, every month we're eating about 21 grams of plastic, which is a lot when you see it visualized. Every six months, you're chomping on a bowl of plastic cereal. And every year we're consuming around 250 grams of plastic. And so there are a lot of health implications that um, this kind of research looking into how eating plastic is changing, specific, particularly um, female health, um, is still poorly understood. But there are a lot of very smart people trying to figure out how to mitigate the amount of plastic that we're eating and how to help people who are being negatively impacted by plastic consumption. Um, and a small caveat, this 
uh, estimation does not include people who drink regularly from single-use plastic water bottles. Um, that exponentially increases the amount of plastic that's entering your body um, on a regular basis. So that was excluded. Um, this is for people who are not drinking like a Dasani water bottle a day. So there's a very brief and coarse introduction to microplastics. How has it changed? How has our relationship changed in the age of COVID-19? Um, and I saw a great tweet the other day that said, uh, the years of work that we've put into reducing our plastic waste entering our waterways has just made space for more masks and gloves, which unfortunately seems to be the trend. Um, with the onset of the global pandemic, uh, there has been this kind of negative trend that's emerged where people are using gloves and single use face masks um, when they go to the grocery store, when they go out with friends, but then when they get back into their car, rather than bring potentially contaminated um, protective gear into the, their vehicle, they just leave it on the, in the parking lot, um, which is a really big problem because both the single-use masks and the nitrile, which are plastic gloves, um, then are left to just wash into, you know, whatever sort of drainage um, that is nearby. And it's also a health risk for the workers there who have to then go around and clean up the parking lot where there are two dozen masks and you know, a ton of gloves laying around. I wanna take a second to acknowledge a major change that happened in March when the whole world shut down <laughs> for a little while. Um, in 2017, which is the most recent estimate of our annual waste production in the United States, we estimated around 35 and a half million tons of plastic being disposed of, and 8.4% of that was recycled. In 2019, China stopped accepting our recyclables, which caused that 8.4 estimation um, to drop way down to about three and a half percent recycled. That was last year. This year, just based on January through April, um, it's expected that Americans are producing about 30% more garbage. Why? Uh, you know, why are we suddenly producing so much more? And a big part is that restaurants closed and shopping centers closed. So we started turning to organizations like Grubhub who were willing to, their entire system is built on takeaway services. So delivering food to your home. So you were still able to get the food that you enjoy from the restaurants you love um, to your home. And so in the first quarter of 2020, they saw a 12% increase in their revenue and a 24% increase in their usership. Um, and this was because people were suddenly, who might have been going out on a regular basis, were getting food delivered on a regular basis, which is awesome. What a wonderful modern convenience for in this time. However, when you get food delivered, it often comes in like plastic clamshells with plastic utensils and all tied up in a little plastic bag, um, as opposed to going to the same restaurant where it'd be served on plates with silverware and glasses. Um, so that's a, a big section um, of this additional waste is coming from takeaway services. And with shopping stores um, closing, Amazon really was fitting into um, that open niche where people started delivering or ordering um, online a lot of the goods that they couldn't find in their local grocery stores. And in the first quarter of 2020, Amazon saw a 26% increase uh, in revenue, which is stunning seeing as what a, a just mega huge site this already had been. Um, and so the deliveries are often come in plastic bags or the boxes are in bags to keep everything dry. Um, they're securely um, stabilized in boxes, whatever you're ordering um, with poly bags, those plastic like air filled bags to keep everything secure. Um, and so if you were going to the store to go buy a couple of books and instead you were ordering your books from Amazon, you would get a triple wrapped plastic mess um, that would be secure and undamaged ideally. Um, and again, plastic is the best at what it does, which is why it's so commonly used for all of these things. 
Um, but so with the increase in use of Amazon and getting those deliveries, the increased use of Grubhub and DoorDash and those kind of other deliveries, it makes sense why we were going through so much more waste than this time last year. At the same time, um, a number of material recovery facilities, um, also called MRFs or recycling centers, um, have stopped operating because just given the nature of the um, work, you have to pack everyone together shoulder to shoulder to be pulling non-recyclables out of the conveyor belt system um, so the recycling can be done efficiently. Uh, because of the need to keep people spaced apart, um, these facilities, many could not adapt fast enough and had to stop um, their production. So we're producing more waste and we are decreasing our infrastructure to take care of it. And it is adding an increasing amount of pressure to curbside recycling. Um, so a number of curbside recycling programs around the country, somewhere between 80 and 120 um, neighborhoods and communities have stopped their recycling programs uh, for a number of reasons. It might be because their nearest um, recycling facility has closed and they have to take it farther or the charging, the amount being charged for recycling has really increased given the higher need. Um, but it, is very frustrating, right? As a, a person who's trying their best to decrease our amount of waste entering landfills or very large incinerators, um, you know, we rely on this sort of recycling process. We wash and clean our recycling, we sort it effectively, and then everything just is going to the dump for the incinerator. Um, so this has been a pretty big blow to um, the plastic-free movement. Um, and then, you know, at the municipal and state level, there have been big changes taking place. Um, many of the uh, efforts and laws that were being put in place last year have been suspended from San Francisco, who was really leading the way in a lot of the reusable um, kind of plastic reduction efforts, um, has suspended allowing people to bring reusable containers from home. New York, Massachusetts, Maine, and Oregon are all deferring state laws um, to ban or reduce plastic bags uh, being used in grocery stores. New Hampshire has um, transitioned to not allowing um, reusable bags, so they're switching back to paper and plastic, plastic bags. And California is not charging the 10 cent tax that was added per bag as an, a kind of decentive for using single use bags. And unfortunately, the CDC has recommended that when restaurants reopen, which we've already seen start to happen, um, they switch to completely disposable, throw everything away after a customer interacts with it. So from menus to plates and utensils to even condiments, um, rather than having a refillable condiment on the table or at the bar, um, you have like single use ketchup packets. And I say unfortunately, um, unfortunately for this effort that had been really gaining a lot of strength and momentum. All of these changes that are being implemented are strictly happening for the public health. Um, so it's really easy and I find myself very frequently getting a little down about this, but remembering that the safety and health and well-being of all people in our country is really the, the pinnacle of what we're aiming for. That being said, um, there has been some literature um, coming out that is suggesting that plastic might not be the best answer. Um, so the New England Journal of Medicine recently published a study that suggested um, SARS-CoV-2, which is just the COVID-19 virus, um, is more stable on plastic and stainless steel than on copper or cardboard. Um, and on plastic, viable virus was detected 72 hours after application. So that means three days after they smeared virus all over a plastic sample, they came back and it was still infectious. Um, so that, that raises some questions over, should we be going purely plastic, a disposable economy until we get the virus under control? Or can you use something like a canvas bag that the virus is going to be unable to survive on for very long. Um, 
And really, there's been a push from the scientific community to kind of get back into the reusable cycle because it's very easy to, you know, wash and sanitize your glass or reusable bag um, rather than throwing away plastic that then a municipal worker or wait staff is going to have to empty out of garbage cans into, you know, a dumpster from the dumpster into a garbage truck. And if it takes two days for that, there could be active virus that is being exposed to that are, you know, municipal workers or waiters are being exposed to. So there's a lot happening, a lot of discussion focusing specifically on the topic of plastic and is single use the way to go. Um, a huge caveat is this is all new and this research is coming out really frustratingly slowly because the people doing the work are doing it right. Um, but I do want to encourage everyone to kind of keep an eye out as these studies come together and, and be pretty critical of, of the work that's being done. Um, and remember that every choice that we make not only has the um, importance uh, for our environment, but also the importance for our fellow human being. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, this paper was really fantastic. Um, I can send you the resource if you're curious about it. Well, it's a little dry, but it's a scientific paper. Um, so how can we, as individuals in this age of COVID, cut back on our plastic use? Um, one awesome alternative to bagging, getting grocery store bags um, is to just get your products and put them in your cart after purchasing them bring them to your car and load them into your reusable bags in your car. Um, there's no rules about that and it does prevent you from having um, an increased number of single-use plastic bags that you then have to figure out how to get rid of. Um, so that's a, a pretty neat option. Um, shopping smarter and extending the life of perishable items in your fridge, um, being sure that you're storing everything properly. You know, don't put your potatoes and onions together um, because it increases spoilage, things like that. Um, there's a lot of awesome resources online and I'd love to hear from the group what we can be doing. Um, you know, smart ideas, interesting tips that you've found to extend the life of your perishable products. Um, normally I would say go shop in the bulk section, but most bulk sections have been dismantled at this time. Um, so it has been kind of leading us to be a little more creative with our recommendations, right? And then swapping out things like saran wrap and plastic wrap from your, from your house um, to use uh, reusable options like beeswax wraps, which are really, really cool and support apiaries. There are a lot of local beeswax wrap makers in this area. Um, or just using, you know, like your glass Tupperware, or plastic Tupperware, something that you can wash, sanitize, and reuse. Um, and of course, a plug, you always have to support your local industry, so your CSAs and farmers markets. Um, we've been trying really hard to cut back on ordering from Amazon. It is really tricky, um, especially now, like it's summertime. I want to be getting all of those fun things that I would be normally going to a grocery store to, to shop for. But, you know, the temptation is always to order online. So that's been a really hard habit to break. Um, and then a big one is wearing a reusable face mask. So something that's made of fabric that you can throw in the washing machine to sanitize uh, rather than the single use face masks, which really our healthcare workers desperately need right now. Um, and there are a lot of beautiful patterns coming out and affordable options for reusable masks. Um, they're also not too difficult to make if you have a sewing machine or a lot of time on your hands to hand sew. Um, and then this last bullet point is a little, I hesitated putting it in and it's don't wear gloves. And I'm going to have a heavy, heavy caveat on this unless it's totally necessary. So if you wear gloves to the grocery store and you're just shopping, you're, you know, touching things here, touching things here, maybe, you know, you pick your face, you pick your phone, or just transferring germs all over the place. Gloves don't self-sanitize, um, so when you're wearing gloves, it should be with intention. Um, doctors change gloves between patients. They change gloves sometimes, multiple times in one patient visit. Um, so wearing gloves does not prevent the virus from gathering on them. Um, so just 
be aware of that and use them very smartly. And if you do have to wear gloves, which I do oftentimes, especially when we're doing stream cleanups or trash pickup, always wearing gloves, um, be sure that you're disposing of them safely. So into a garbage can, not next to your car. Um, but there, I mean, there are a million different things that a lot of people are recommending. So I'm hoping to open this up into a conversation um, in just a minute. So we are, as an organization, as well as Town Conservation Trust, participating in this choose to refuse single use plastic um, from Plastic Free July. And we participated last year and had a lot of success and a lot of fun. I know that I learned a ton. Um, one of our co-op students from last year, Casey, is on the call now. And I know she was really influential in um, helping educate us on how we were participating effectively with our Plastic Free July. Um, and Lindsay actually has been instrumental in making changes as an, in our organization. So I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to highlight some of the efforts that we've made um, beyond just our own personal changes. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks for uh, all of that information. It's, you know, I think participating in this um, Plastic Free July movement last year was a, such a huge eye opener, both at, at my personal home and in the workspace, especially since at the Rushton Conservation Center, we do a lot of uh, hosting here. We host culinary experiences. We have, um, we're grateful to have educational programming come in here, but a lot of food and beverage is um, incorporated in that. And it seemed like a no brainer. Let's see how during this time, we can be more responsible and cut down on our waste, realizing that recycling, while we used to think that was a solution, it very clearly is not <laughs> um, at all anymore. So I think just really trying to eliminate that plastic use to begin with is now where I personally um, have uh, just shifted my focus. So here at the Russian Conservation Center, since we do um, have the pleasure of hosting and look forward to hosting people again here, we are currently closed right now. Um, we have some really simple, you know, practices that we have that we have here. One is glassware that we allow anybody who is using the space to use, along with china and stainless steel flatware that we can then sanitize and wash and reuse again, um, which is great. We have a water fountain that has a water bottle, bottle refill station. So we encourage anybody to bring their own water bottle in and it's delicious filtered well water. And um, that has been wonderful. And it you know tracks how many bottles you save. Um, so we can continue to look at that. And um, we, we have partnered with other professionals that are like-minded uh, when it comes to service. So we, have wonderful caterers and chefs that we do partner with. And um, we have a list of guidelines of how we do events here at the Russian Conservation Center and how we focus on low waste. And uh, we are so happy to have found some professionals who, again, share those practices in their business as well and just continue to bring awareness um, to that because the hospitality industry um, especially now, like Lauren was just saying, under the guise of safety, which is very important, it's very wasteful, even pro-COVID. And um, in kind of going into that, if we do have to use single-use um, plates or flatware or drinkware, then we do try to incorporate something that we can recycle. We know we can. It's plant-based. This is bamboo, which, you know, literally grows like a weed. <laughs> And, uh, you know, corn-based um, flatware, uh, which holds up really well, and then go through the right avenues there to compost that in a responsible way. It's not going to just compost in your backyard compost necessarily. So we, um, we take those measures, and um, it also goes into all of our paper goods that we use here. You know, when you, we do have, you know, our toilet paper and our... Um, paper towels, and even down to our waste bags. Um, we have started to purchase recycled goods that come completely wrapped in cardboard and paper instead of wrapped in plastic. So that is, 
you know, when we are busy, we can tend to go through a lot of that as most households can as well. And we also have a really great inventory of, um, of rags that we try try to use as well and we, re we wash those, we reuse them. I do that at home as well. It's a great way to eliminate um, just paper waste even um, there too. And uh, we have an effort here. There's a wonderful organization um, called TerraCycle. I learned about that last year from one of our participants and we'll be sending some information and resources out to you guys after this. Um, but they recycle hard to recycle things like you can see this on my little screen here. Um, snack wrappers that are foil lined, batteries, um, toothpaste tubes. Uh, I mean, it, the list just goes on and on. I really encourage you to check out, uh, they're a great resource. And I've learned a lot um, about even or companies who do produce these hard to recycle items that actually do also partner with them and you can send it back. Um, so be sure to look for the TerraCycle logo, which um, you can look that up and uh, it'll be on the back of like, uh, I think like Tom's of Maine, they partner with them. Um, some snack companies, if you have kids, it can be really a huge challenge with individually wrapped items. Um, of course, the goal is to not use those, but you can also collect them and submit them back to TerraCycle to be responsibly um, handled. So we do collect those both at our main office and here at the RCC um, and send those back uh, hopefully when things open up a little bit more again and talking to them about partnering um, and what they can do with nonprofits and other organizations to and companies to manage some of the waste that is produced in the workplace. Um, pens. I mean, the list goes on. I could talk about it forever, but I won't. Um, but those are some of the things that we're doing here. And um, yeah, we look forward to opening it up now, Lauren. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and last year we had a lot of discussion around how you can replace a lot of the goods that do come in single use containers like uh, deodorants or toothpaste and things like that. Um, and we will be sending out those resources in a follow up email. Um, so if you were coming here hoping to learn how to you know, make your own chapstick, well, we got you, um, it'll be a follow up. So there have just been so many changes in the last couple of months that we thought it was important to highlight those. Um, but, you know, with that, I would like, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see what's going on in the, is there anything in the chat? Or does anyone have thoughts, questions, concerns? Um, I was just going to say, I look forward to receiving your um, information because I do really like to recycle. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sheila and Bill. Um, yeah, there'll be an email probably in, in the next couple of days. Okay. Bill's outside garden cleanup and I'm in here with you, but I really appreciate always your learning experiences. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, I, it's wonderful to see so many people here with us today hoping to learn more and really jump into this conversation. I'm gonna leave now, so I look forward to your email. Great, thank you so much, Sheila. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. All right. Hi, Lauren. It's Meg. Hey, Meg. Thanks for joining us today. Good to see you guys. Ah, sorry. Um, pepper in my throat. Um, all right, girls. Great information. Um, thanks for sharing a lot. I look forward to the follow-up. Um, the recycling of the products um, that we use, I find that the hardest thing is like the... Um, shampoos and deodorants and everything that, you know, it's just, it's hard to find places to um, recycle those. So I'm looking forward to getting that information from, I think Lindsay said that was uh, some resources she could share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are awesome um, companies like Loop that you can subscribe yep. to, and then you mm -hmm. can just join in on the, you return your waste. 
Um, and there are a lot of amazing companies that are gaining a lot of traction and have gained kind of national um, attention for the efforts that they're putting into their recyclability or the reclaiming their the containers that they sell. Um, so there's a lot of really awesome information. It's would. I could probably talk all day about the variety of different things we could do. <laughs> uh, well, 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 we'll read about it when you send it. Thanks. A lot of oh, good yeah. information and a lot of updates, um, especially in light of all the increased waste that we've had to deal with and um, for the public safety, like you said, in the last couple of months. So very timely. Thank you, Lauren and everybody. Yeah, happy to share. I'm just going to jump in to mention something that personally, um, I think last year, it can feel very heavy. This is, especially now with, you know, the pandemic, it almost feels like where, where can we go? What can we do? How can we really make an impact? And focusing on, especially if you're new to sort of a lower waste lifestyle, just pick one thing, just start with one thing. And it truly does make a difference. And um, I know that like with, Lauren and our whole community here and with my friends who have done it, it's really fun to then talk about. So, <laughs> um, but just really start simple with one place that feels safe and comfortable to you and go from there. Yeah, one of the first changes that we made as a household was um, decreasing the size of our trash can and increasing the size of our recycling bin um, just to really it, it helped us to become more aware like, oh, we have to take out the trash can constantly. Um, and that's just minor irritation. So we started changing our patterns. So we had to stop taking our trash out so frequently. Um, I know that it's a little more complicated now with our recycling, but it seems like um, at least in most of the municipalities in our area, recycling is still going on as usual. So, um, you know, just even making that, that little kind of change um, can highlight kind of that like, oh, right, we're throwing away a lot of stuff. Maybe we should look at why. How about uh, birds and balloons? Aren't balloons a real problem? Balloons are one of my least favorite things in the whole world. We, we find them in the woods, we find them in the streams, um, and the the shiny reflective like shaped balloons tend to be really big problems. Um, as it breaks down, it'll be consumed by all manner of things. Um, yeah, and birds will eat plastic. They're, I mean, many of our organisms in our world are just not aware of how to distinguish plastics from food. Um, but birds seem to be one of the most visible um, I guess, casualties, but yeah, they'll eat balloons. Oh, okay, thank you. <clears throat> yep, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to say that since last um, July, um, like I was trying really hard, hard to really reduce my plastic and with COVID-19, like I've kind of just accepted like that I can't do everything, but it, so I was getting kind of discouraged and kind of just accepting like, well, I have to buy this or this in plastic because it's the only option. But I think this was a really good like motivator and reminder that there are ways to like, you can find creative ways or just um, say, I'm not gonna buy that because it is in plastic. So yeah, I just wanted to say that this was really helped me um, find some motivation to continue reducing my plastic personally. Awesome. Thanks, Casey. That is really great to hear. Um, and last year, Casey really did lead the charge in organizing us um, with our Plastic Free July and holding us accountable for check-ins on how we were reducing our plastic consumption. Um, so it's so great that you're back and re-motivated for our 2020 effort. Yes, definitely. <laughs> All right, and it looks like we have some thoughts in the chat. Um, any groups or individuals to follow on social media who talk about recycling and reducing waste? Um, absolutely. Uh, I follow a number of different people. Um, 
one of my favorites. Uh, her name is Lauren and she's from um, Package Free is her company, um, but she's young and um, probably five or six years ago, she was on Times, the cover of the, the Times Magazine um, with the amount of waste she had produced in several years in a small mason jar. Uh, but she does a really incredible job of highlighting the issues and then highlighting action steps. So whenever I see her posts, um, you know, it, it always ends with what you can be doing. Um, and we will share those. Um, there's a number of other people from around the world who are making efforts. Um, so we can share those users to follow, um, to make good suggestions. Um, in our follow-up email. I should have had a list in front of me. Um, but organizations too, like um, NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Association, uh, they do um, plastic tracking. And you can go on their website um, to see and learn more from like a scientific perspective where plastic waste in on the Jersey Shore is coming from because oftentimes it's coming from another continent. Um, so with the plastic tracking, it, it kind of shines a light on our global system. So that's a really awesome suggestion. Um, and packagefreeshop.com has a lot of awesome information. Um, you can purchase goods, but it is a reseller, so it tends to be slightly more expensive. Um, however, it gives you the links to go back to the original producers, but it has a lot of great information on different, um, each different product, its pros and cons, and then how to properly get rid of the um, item when you're done with it. So it's, it's a really awesome resource. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns, emotions? <laughs> oh, great. Um, here's a question from the chat. Uh, Lucy asks, are there financial barriers and costs that the individual consumer or household may encounter when it comes to recycling? That's a great question. Um, and that's gonna break out municipality by municipality. Um, so I know in my hometown last December, there was a change where recycling um, became much more expensive uh, because we had been sending a lot of our recycling to Asia to be taken care of. Um, and so the town started deferring those costs to individuals. And depending on how many people subscribe to the new tax for recycling is what would determine the cost. Um, so you can look at, at your municipal website to see if there are going to be changes um, or increased costs um, for where you're living. Um, however, I find um, there are a lot of ways that we can just reuse rather than recycle. So, I mean, my breakfast this morning was in an old coconut oil jar that I just haven't gotten around to taking the label off of yet. Um, so we are constantly reusing glass containers um, and um, packaging. So that's a like zero cost to us. And in fact, we're saving money because I am notoriously bad at tra keeping track of my Tupperware. Um, so rather than, you know, constantly have to purchase new Tupperware and replace what I've broken or lost, I just am reusing something that may have been recycled in the first place. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the taxes that pay for recycling are based on where you live. So it is kind of a tricky situation um, and it is not broken out evenly. So thank you, that's an awesome question. And, I wish I could answer more, but there's so many townships around here with different ordinances that it would it would be a day long lecture in itself. Um, and an option, oh. All right, so Philadelphia has been collecting every other week. 
that's that's awesome. Um, yeah, Philly has been working really hard. It's it's good to have a city that takes this very seriously. So um, rather than just canceling services. Great, thank you so much. Going to mention just sort of. Um, oh, somebody else is trying to talk. Um, I, I remember having our live lunch and learn on this topic last year, and the uh, the quandary about nut butters and the plastic container that a nut butter comes in, and how difficult that is to um, clean is something I experience on a weekly basis as well. So I've shifted to like Lauren was saying, the glass, and then I reuse that for a, even a drinking glass. Most of my drinking ware is now jam jars and peanut butter jars, I will admit in public. But um, I've done the same thing with bread bags. Um, you know, coming to the CSA here at Rushton Farm, when I'm processing, I save my bread bags and wash them like I would any other um, plastic bag since I don't purchase them anymore. Um, but there's so much trash in your own home that again, if you just wash soapy, warm soapy water and sanitize. Um, it's amazing what you can get sort of for free <laughs> and not have to worry about recycling for a while. Yeah, and it's important to remember that plastic is a pretty new invention. So going plastic free is really depression era living. Um, so if you are unsure about ways to make um, substitutions and you have a grandparent or you know an older neighbor who's willing to talk to you about the ways that they used to do everything um, I know that I have been talking frequently to my very um, elderly grandmother who remembers what it was like before plastic was um, present. Um, so, you know, remembering that this is a very modern problem and that there are people still alive in our communities who remember what it was like before and they have lots of really clever and low cost solutions. Um, because oftentimes um, the cost can be, if you're going out to buy, say, like a bamboo toilet brush, it's four times the cost despite being sustainably sourced and, um, you know, disposable. But, you know, you can talk to someone who was alive before plastics to remember, oh, right, this is trendy. So what are the less trendy, you know, it might not be Instagram worthy, but it is still going to be functional and um, serve the purpose that you need. All right, and we have another question from Jason. Do you have any resources regarding composting in your own backyard and pickup services? Composting is the bomb. Thank you so much for suggesting that. Um, we can share some resources. I know last year at our follow-up to Plastic Free July, we had an excellent woman come in and talk about um, our composting business. Um, so Lindsay, I don't know if you wanna shine some light on, on that. I just um, actually just shared her, uh, we did, we had um, a woman who goes by Mother Compost and we had another a lunch and learn um, that was focused really all around composting because it is a great way to manage your waste. And if you do any research about how much food waste does go into landfills and does not break down in a great way, um, it can be an amazing thing to do and really fun. I think um, I started composting just last year. Um, I have a container that I ordered off the internet from Amazon, um, but it, it's worked really well and it's fed my garden beautifully. And Mother Compost, um, she is local here on the mainline um, area, but there are other compost pickup services. They will provide you with a container and then actually physically come and pick it up for you. Uh, and manage it for you if you don't have the space. Um, there are also a lot of really amazing resources uh, out there and information that I kind of find fascinating that Lauren can talk about more because it's up the bug alley. Um, but you know, for apartment composting and um, using different kinds of insects to help to break that down. So there's a lot of different um, information out there and fun ways to explore um, managing your own food waste. And so we'll, uh, we're gonna send you guys a lot of information, I think, after this. Um, and maybe keep an eye out, maybe we'll do you know, a little talk about composting in the future as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a lot of resources 
online um, and we'll we'll put together a, a list of our favorite things to share with everyone. Um, like Lindsay, I've been composting in my backyard for about a year. We put in several bins. Um, so you put your food waste out and periodically over time you have to add um, goods from your yard, clippings, leaves, and then flipping it regularly to get that good dispersal of nutrients um, and heat. And if you live in the city with a trash disposal or a garbage disposal in your sink, that actually does work. Um, Philadelphia Water uses the garbage disposal. Is it Philadelphia Water, Casey? I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, it's just funny because I just try to put anything I can down the garbage disposal. And I didn't think about how that's like really reduces food waste. And I think, I forget what they use it for, but. Yeah. They use it for, uh, as a bioenergy source. Yeah. Uh, so in Philadelphia, any new building has to have a um, garbage disposal in the sink. And then that waste is filtered out and used as a bioreactor. Now, I don't know too much about that. We read about it um, a fair amount last year. Um, but there's a lot of awesome resources. Philadelphia is, is working really hard um, on this. So it's, it's really great, again, to have a city that is being proactive, um, especially with the food waste. Um, and back in the day, Philly's composting situation used to be that you could put a bucket of your food waste out and pig farmers from New Jersey would come pick up the compost um, and then use it to feed their hogs. But as that industry died, so did the composting infrastructure for the city. Um, so the trash disposal or garbage disposal in the sink was the next best solution. Just a little kind of out there history. But great, thank you for that question, Jason. All right, and if, I think we have time for maybe one more question. And if not, that is okay. All right, so I'm gonna take this last couple of minutes um, to share some upcoming events. Um, we have another Lunch and Learn from Home uh, talking about nesting birds in your yard, um, which is going to be so exciting to learn about. Um, as a water person, I always love learning more about birds um, and our avian community members. Um, so that is with Blake Ball. And that is next Wednesday at noon. And we have a very exciting announcement.